here at God Lover Church on uh, prime time. We we're going through some different popular television shows and we're discussing, um, if you haven't caught the theme yet, very uh, a lot of fundamentals about Christianity, about salvation, about how God changes us, about how it's important for us to find uh, our motivation in Christ, for us to come together as a community. And uh, I'm going to be discussing today, uh, our, our theme is, is CSI Miami, but instead of CSI standing for Crime Scene Investigators, I'm going to be talking about uh, those of us who conceal our sins inside, who have secret wow. sins. And so, uh, you know, we, we talked about um, how important it is for ha us to have community. And so today we're going to talk about some of the important things that you can do inside of that community. And, and you know, when I look at, at CSI Miami, uh, I laugh a lot, especially with the, the David Caruso lines, because he puts his sunglasses on. It's the same, like, $5 pair of blue block blockers that you see in, like, airports. And uh, he says his, his witty little line. But every time after he says the line, if you pay attention afterwards, you'll see he always cuts stage right. He always bolts. He says his line, boom, and leaves. And there's one scene on here where he's in the middle of a, he's on a boat in the middle of the ocean. He, there's nowhere to go. And he says, uh, you know, the tide is rising in. We have a sinking time or crime scene. And then he just bolts. It's like, where's he going? Is he walking on the water? Is he taking a swim? I don't know. Uh, and it doesn't have to make sense because I think CSI Miami takes pride in the fact that it's corny. Uh, <clears throat> but when you take a look at, at CSI, you see that a lot of the, the episodes follow the same formula. You have this event that takes place, typically a murder. Somebody gets hurt, and there's this whole plethora uh, of people who may be um, suspects, who may have been responsible for what happened, and they all have these secrets that they're hiding, these secret sins. Uh, and, and at first, you know, the original, earlier episodes, earlier seasons, it was always just one or two guys, and they would narrow down through, you know, investigating the crime scene, uh, who to thunk it, and, and figuring out who, you know, who actually committed the murder. But as time has gone on, they've even gotten more elaborate in it. There's like 75 people in every episode, and they all have like different combating um, motives. And you know, you find out that this guy Hank, who you thought killed somebody, really just likes to wear pink dresses on Saturday nights. And it's like, what's that have to do with the episode? Nothing it has nothing to do with it. But uh, they they find out who has the secret, who uh, who's hiding something, who's responsible, and you find that their secret always finds them out. Uh, I had an uncle. Growing up, and I still have an uncle, he's still alive. And, and when he was in his 20s, he was kind of this rip-roaring motorcycle guy. He liked to get on his bike, uh, go flying down the, uh, the roads in Iowa, and, and just cause havoc and mischief. And, and his mother was always really concerned about, uh, you know, how responsible he was being with his motorcycle. She would tell him, you know, make sure you wear a leather jacket or your pads or your, you know, your wrist braces. And, and, you know, go out there. But that's not manly, and that's not tough, and, and you know, he... He would ignore her, and one time uh, he got into a motorcycle accident. Uh, he got messed up pretty well, but good enough to where he could walk it off, like walk away from it, wear some clothes, and kind of hide his injuries. 
And it wasn't until a few weeks later that he was, he was really feeling sick. He really wasn't doing that great. And what they found out is that as he was hiding these injuries under these clothes, he wasn't going to get medical attention. Uh, he was hiding these things that he had experienced. They, uh, there, he got a staph, I believe it was a staph infection, and it started a line over one of these injuries on his leg that was um, crawling, kind of growing its way up his body as this infection took over. And they, they, he eventually had to go to the hospital. hospital. He had to admit it to his mother. He, um, he went, he got it taken care of, but they said that if he had not done this earlier, if he had um, hidden this to full completion, that this infection would have taken over his body, would have reached his heart, and it would have um, probably killed him. And I think that uh, when we look at situations like this, we can see some definite uh, correlations with sin in our lives and these things, these infections uh, that we see in physical bodies. So there's a spiritual aspect of things and there's a physical aspect of things. And sin is kind of like uh, a spiritual infection. And when we, uh, we look at situations like this and, and we say, well, you know, that only hurts the person involved. Only my uncle would have died if this infection would have taken care of his body. Uh, but you look at other situations across the world and you see that that's not the case, that there's lots of situations, especially with sin, um, when it comes to a spiritual level, that it doesn't just affect the person, it affects the community around them. So when I grew up, it was, there was a, a big scandal in church uh, by Jim Baker and Tammy Baker uh, and um, Jimmy Swaggart as well. And these were people who grew up who were really well known in their communities and they were found out in secret sins, just different levels, whether it be money or sexual promiscuity, that completely destroyed and wrecked their churches. Uh, in 2006, something that was a little bit more recent to our times, we all have heard about Ted Haggard, uh, who led a church of over 10,000 people and tried to keep um, a secret that he had a meth addiction and was committing adultery. And we can see how even somebody who was in a prominent position in the church had secret sin in their lives, and when they couldn't hide it, when it came out, when their sin found them out, uh, it destroyed not just them, but their parishioners, the church community as a whole. You know, we're here in Washington, which is a, which is very far away from where Ted Haggard's church is, and yet you'll still hear people talk about it here today. Uh, but it's not just situations that, that happen in the church. We find these scandals that are affecting, you know, even an entire nation happening here in America. Uh, you look at the Watergate scandal. You look at Nixon, who who made some bad decisions, and for the very first time, and the only time in American history, was forced to resign from his position as President of the United States because secrets that he was keeping inside. More recently, we look at the Bill Clinton scandal with Monica Lewinsky, and, and for me, that was you know close to around my high school years. For some of you, uh, maybe you're a little bit younger, but it was a big deal when I heard this. When these things were taking place, these were things that shook our entire nation. We were um, dealing with different situations overseas, and nations from all over the world were laughing at us, were mocking, at us, mocking us because of the moral decisions of a leader. <clears throat> These sorts of situations have been happening for thousands of years, and I want to show you uh, what this kind of even looked like in the Bible. We see these types of things happening uh, way back even in the beginning of time, where we have Adam and Eve who try to hide the fact that they had this apple and they're ditty bopping through the Garden of Eden trying to mind their own business and God's like, you know, what's going on? What's happening? Why are you hiding yourselves from me? And they say, God, don't look at us. We're naked. And God asks, why are you, well, how do you know that you're naked? And their sin finds them out. We look at Joshua chapter 7 where they had just finished, the Israelites had just finished conquering Jericho. This miraculous event had taken place and God had told them, take everything within Jericho and destroy it. And now I want you to go on and continue taking over the land of Canaan. And I want you to conquer uh, the, the land of Ai. These people in Ai. And so jo Joshua, you know, on the fumes of victory, says, come on, let's go do this thing. And he has them spy out the people in Ai. And, and his spies come back and say, you know what? We don't even have to take our entire nation after those, these people. They're small. Let's just grab about 3,000 men, hop over the hill, conquer them. God's on our side, and we're going to be fine. And... Instead of that happening, they send the 3,000 people after the people of AI, and they get their butts handed to them. Uh, they, they, start getting, they start losing people. Their people are dying. They run back to Joshua, and they say, we don't understand what's happening. Joshua falls on his hands and knees. He rips his clothes, and he starts calling out to God, God, what's going on? You said that you were with us. And God says, Joshua, there's sin amidst you. And, and he doesn't say that, that one person sinned. He says, Israel has sinned. He says, the nation has sinned. And so... Joshua, under the direction of God, begins to speak to the different people in Israel and gets to a man named Achan, and, and he says, Achan, why don't you tell me what you've done? 
Why don't you come clean with me and tell me your sin? And, and Achan says, I've sinned against the Lord. And, and what had happened was in this event, probably at Jericho, he had found a robe, he had found clothes uh, that he had stolen, that he had buried underneath his tent. He had, he had um, acted out against God's specific order. And because of that, God wasn't supporting Israel. And it was only through the destruction of those things, the destruction of that sin, that Israel was allowed to become clean again in the eyes of God and went back against the exact same people and God was with them in the battle and they won. When we look at Proverbs chapter 29, verse 1, uh, we see that, that the Bible supports these things. It says that he who is often reproved and yet stiffens his neck will suddenly be beyond healing. These people who buck against known sin, these people that hide sin in their lives, eventually that sin is going to break your back beyond healing if you continue to go after. We see these themes in the Bible of, of those who have hardened hearts and those who become kind of callous to their own sin. They don't think it's a big deal. They don't think that that, that one thing that they've done, whether it's stealing a Snickers bar or you know murdering someone, they, they think of these varying levels of sin. They say, oh, I just you know I stole to eat. And it's not that big of a deal. And yet we find out in, in Corinthians that these sins are all the same. That a sin against God is still a sin that will deny you access into heaven. In Romans chapter 2 verse 16 it says, On that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. That will be judged by the sins in our lives. Whether or not we've announced them, if we keep them sacred, secret, we're still going to be judged by them. Ecclesiastes 12.14 says, For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. And, and, and all this might sound scary to you guys. I know this isn't something that's easy to listen to or super friendly on the ears, but it's good. It should scare you because these are serious things. And, and many times I know that you think that, that you're the only one that, you might, uh, that might be fooling the world. Once again, we talked about how you, you might be in a situation where you're like, I'm the only person that I'm hurting. But I think, that, uh, I think that you find in these situations that the people closest to us know the sins in our lives. And if we're in a community group, if we're in a small group, if we're in a healthy community with people, with a church like Kramer was speaking about a couple weeks ago, that we'll find that those around us know exactly what's going on in our lives. And I think it might look something similar to this. job hiding sins in our lives. The Bible says that we will be found out anyway. We look at Luke chapter 12, verse 2 through 3. It says that nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light. And what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. And, and so we look at this and we say we're screwed, right? And I'm not trying to pretend that I'm any different than any of you guys. Uh, there's sins that I still struggle with in my life. And, and there's a song that was written in 1757 by, name, by a man named Robert Robinson that says, Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. 
prone to leave the God I love. And there's days where I struggle with that. There's days where, where I feel a drawing to just hide my own sin. And, and I encourage you, I want to encourage you, don't do that. Get involved in a community group. Get involved with people who can help hold you accountable. Talk to them. There's times where I have to sit down with people that I trust. I just did it last week. Uh, people, times where I have to sit down with my wife and talk to her about things that I struggle with, where I can find correction, where I can find things that, that God needs to work on in my life, or things that, that God's prompting me to work on in my life. And fortunately, there's good news. There's good news when we read Proverbs 28 through 13. It says, Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. And the Catholic Church has tried to turn that into a situation where you come into a church and you confess in front of a priest. And you know, though I might not agree with all the, the practices of the Catholic Church, I think public confession, confession of our sins to someone, uh, can be good for the soul. It can help us through situations. And in 1 John 1, 1.9 it says, If we confess our sins, He, God, Jesus, is faithful and just to forgive our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's something that means a lot to me when I look at that. Because there's lots of situations in my life where I can't handle it on my own, where I feel like I'm pent up, that I'm bottled up, and that I'm suffering, and I need someone to come alongside and suffer alongside of me. That's what we call compassion, to suffer alongside someone. And so I would encourage you to find someone to be compassionate with them and let someone be compassionate with you, to confess your sins to the people and to God, to confess against them, your sins against those who you sinned against. Let's pray. God, we come before you humbled, uh, not as, as one who should be proud of uh, the things that we've done, but, but we want to come to you uh, with our motivations, right? When we look for our, our motivation, for our affirmation, we should find that in you. We pray that as we find these things in our lives that we, that we sin in, that we struggle with, that we won't try to hide those things, that it will break our backs, that it will destroy us, that it will separate us from you. But instead that we'd be able to to not have those things in secret, that we'd be able to partner with those of us in community in a God-honoring way, and that we'd be able to, to live pure and holy lives to the best of, that you empower us with. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Good job, Jason. Thanks,